Drifters. So I brought a few examples with me today and they can kind of look like this. Has anybody heard the term drifter before in terms of science and oceanography? I'm seeing several heads shaking no, a couple shaking their head yes. All right. So it's a device. It doesn't have to look like this, but it's a device that's used in oceanography, so right, the study of our oceans, to study the ocean currents. Now, throughout history, people have been trying to study ocean currents, but we didn't quite have the technology side of it. Does anybody know what the kind of the original drifter was? People used to toss them off boats or in the water and they would hope that they'd wash up and somebody would find it. Oh. Right, our famous message in a bottle. So you could classify your message in a bottle as a drifter. It's kind of, you know, maybe the original drifter. You couldn't get a ton of information from it. You knew, hopefully they put in there where they threw it from, right? The location it was. You might know the year that it was tossed in and where it started. And then wherever you picked it up, right? So you got a starting point and an in location. But what you missed was how it got from A to B. Most of the time it wasn't a nice from me to you type path. It was, I would wander through all the rows and maybe circle a few times and then I might end up right here, right? So we could get some information from a message in a bottle. And this is one I found after um, Matthew came through on the island and washed up. It's a little middle school girl who wrote a really sweet note but didn't put an address on there. So we saved it. Maybe she'll come back one day and I can show it to her. Um, but yeah, so we had those drifters. Um, and as technology has caught up in recent years, really within the last hundred years, we've been able to improve that but they can also use drifters without technology. And that's kind of the fun part of drifters that we like to teach students about. So we've, we've started talking to students about drifters and one of the really fun things is to tell them about things that get lost in the ocean. If you're familiar with Mobile Bay or this area, you know we get a lot of port traffic. We have a lot of cargo ships that come in and out. On a clear day, you could go out to the end here and you could sometimes see those cargo ships waiting offshore to be brought into our bay. All that cargo doesn't always make it to where it's supposed to go. Some cargo does get lost at sea. So back in 1990, there was a cargo ship headed from Korea to the United States, and he lost about 21 different cargo containers on it. Six of those had Nike shoes. They lost about, I think it's about 61,000 pairs of Nike shoes that got dumped overboard. Well, Nike shoes float if you put them out in the water. And they knew where that cargo had been lost. And about a year later, in the beaches in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, all of these Nike shoes started washing up. So this is an image from one that actually happened in Europe, but it, the beaches really did look like this. And so in 1991, they just had all of these shoes washing up along the coast and they literally had beachcomber swap meets where you could come and bring your pairs of Nike shoes, your size sevens or eights, and you're looking for this match over here, right? You've got one, and they would do swap meets. So again, they were learning about ocean currents from things that weren't intended to necessarily be drifters, but they did a good job, right? They knew where they started from, where they ended up, and they tracked them over the years, right? They didn't go out in the water and look for them, they just waited for them to wash up. But it was teaching us about the ocean currents and they were, scientists were able to use that data to start to predict how that circulation might be working in the Pacific Ocean for those shoes to wash up. They fell off the ship, um, I can't remember how many miles out, but it was off the, the coast of the Pacific Northwest and they basically just went right into there and then scooted up the coast and then just kind of circled um, a few times and then just kept hitting California, the Pacific Northwest and then they did end up in Europe as well. So they made a complete circle uh, and they were washing up for several years. I think it was at least 10 years after that. They were still finding Nike shoes. And all you had to do was run them through the washer, get all that grime off, and they were good to wear, brand new shoes. So people really did wear them and use them. There's some really fun news stories on it and articles if you're interested, look it up later. The Nike shoe spill in it, it'll come up. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. And they have the, the tracks mapped out. I didn't print out that track. I printed out another fun one that the students really enjoy. It has to do with rubber ducks. I can't remember where this one started out. Um, it is on my map here. This one was in 1992. 
And it was over in the Pacific Ocean, um, off the coast, hmm, Russia area, north of Japan, up in there. Um, but it was uh, January 1992, and they lost thousands of these little bitty rubber ducks. And so, again, not as much fun because people really couldn't get as much use out of them, but these rubber ducks started washing up. And they literally went around the world. So these unintentional drifters were able to teach us a lot about the circulation patterns in there. And so oceanographers were, were following them, um, tracking where they were washing up, when they were washing up. It shows them starting in 1992, um, washing up in Hawaii. Um, they made landfall in 2003 up in Alaska, also in 2003 in Maine, and then in Europe, Indonesia, Australia, and even South America. And so they have a beachcombers network that kind of came out of this, this oceanographer's study. And it's called Beachcombers Alert. It's still running today, but where they send in this information. People go out every day and they talk about what has washed up and they know some cargo companies will share where they lose their cargo and what it is. Other times they just get to find this washed up. I wonder where it is. Um, Nike was willing to tell them all the information um, and help the scientists use the data. Not every company that loses cargo was willing to do that. Um, but there's some really fun stories. And there's a couple of really neat books if you're interested in learning about these ducks. One's called Moby Duck. There's another more scientific version of it um, that talks more about the oceanography and how this physical oceanographer was mapping the oceans, tracking these currents, these ducks and sand toys and all of this lost cargo. He kind of made that his life work. It's pretty incredible. Um, for these unintentional drifters, right, and I'll have these up here. You guys can come and look at some of these later if you can't see the, the maps and stuff closer. But that takes us to more of our drifters that we have today that oceanographers use. So they do have several designated parts of what scientists want to have in a drifter. One of the most important ones is that it follows the current. So if it's only following the current, what do they not want to help move it? Wind, right? And so we could put some on the surface to follow wind and just look at the wind surface currents. And wind does drive a lot of our ocean currents. But they're trying to track the currents themselves, not let the wind influence them with air. So most of it is below the water. This black line here where I have this silver piece, um, this is what clamps it in place, is where this drifter sits. So all that sits above the surface is this little piece of white PVC and this red cap. The rest of this is all below the surface. So we have up here where our sensor lives, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We have the body. This part is all called the drogue or the sock. It can have a few different forms. If you've been into the estuarium, we actually have a drifter drogue hanging from the ceiling, and we have the head of one that has all kinds of sensors. Um, looks like a little circuit, right, all in there with everything that it can do to send satellite information is well in there on loan from NOAA. So you can check out a drifter um, that NOAA might deploy. So the head the drogue, and then a lot of times they may also have a weight at the bottom, right? Something to help them stay a little bit stable because they are going to get rocked with any current. Um, hopefully they would survive any big currents that might come through, right? Of course, you know about storms we get in our areas. And they have these, something like this panel, and we call those veins, and that really helps it to catch the current. So this is one that I built for us to use with our students, and I'll talk about that project here in a few minutes. And inside this cap, I don't have it with me today, but we use um, a little satellite tracker. And those can be all sorts of different types of tracker. We use one called a spot tracker. You could definitely use a little Garmin tracker or something like that. But we just need a device that can relay information from our drifter in the water to a satellite, which then talks to us, right, the scientists. And we can be back on land, we could be out on our boat um, getting signal as well. But this way we can follow it and track that information. One of the neat things about our spot tracker is that we can use it with iPads with the students and they could be out on the beach watching it. And every five minutes it sends us a little signal and tells us where it is, right? It sends us the geolocation, the lat and long back to us so that we can follow its track. Um, 
And it's kind of fun, then the students can see it moving and really see what their drifter is doing in local currents or wherever they are. So why do, why do you think scientists use drifters? What information can we get from them? Why might we want them? Seeing how the currents go. Seeing how the currents go. Yeah. Salinity, right? So we can add other sensors to it. Salinity is a big one. We're looking at density, right? So we can look at salinity and temperature differences to know how the different bodies of water are moving within each other. Um, we can also um, put a wind tracker. Sometimes they put stuff on the top to actually look at wind, which the wind is driving the current. We might also look at dissolved oxygen in the water, right? Our fish and animals that live in the ocean need oxygen out of the water, and so we can put that sensor and look at things, especially around here, we get things like jubilees, right? Or you could put it out in the Gulf of Mexico and maybe you want to look at that dead zone area, right? So you put a drifter out there that stays. So that is one of the challenges with these. We use ours for really short durations, the size of ours. Um, so we put them out for maybe a day and then retrieve them. And it really helps for us to stay with them. So we use some of our small boats. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have larger ones offshore, so we have a scientist here at the Sea Lab, uh, Dr. Z DZ, um, and he has studied them, um, has some really large drifters, and they drop them out in Mobile Bay, but they only leave them out um, for a day or two at a time as well. Now the NOAA one that I mentioned inside, they leave them out until they die. So those have a battery life of maybe 30, 60 days and they stay out. Sometimes groups will go out and try to retrieve them from their last signal or if they know they're getting towards the end of it, they can try to go out and retrieve them and either bring it back or put a new battery in it. But that is kind of one of the downsides of drifters is that they only last so long and so they are made kind of temporary. And so then that'll bring us to our trash issue here in a minute. Yeah, but that's a good point. Um, yeah. Probably, I don't know that I've seen any that are going that route. Now they might be able to do that for a while eventually, um, just being in salt water and salt air, we would get some corrosion, but yeah, you would think adding solar energy. I know they make solar um, kind of sail buoys that travel the oceans and collect data, and they look like little sailboats, and they are solar powered. The ones that I have seen used, I haven't ever seen that, but ours are mainly used for short term, and we do try to collect them here. Um, yeah. Do they have them that reach different depths so that they can determine what's going on in the water? Yes, they do. So ours are very, very shallow. And um, we made a couple different designs to test. And this one doesn't have enough depth to it, right? It's really not even getting surface current. It kind of sat in place um, and didn't do much. This one had um, either just a better design or was deep enough. The one that um, our physical oceanographer has, it stands about this tall and has that depth. But yes, your drogue may be very, very long depending on what current you are trying to monitor. Yeah, that's important. It may have sensors too at different levels so that you could look at really the, the surface salinity, right? The salt in the water and maybe, you know, a couple feet down to see if it changes within that just short scale. Yeah, I don't think they really make any to try to go from surface all the way to bottom, on a, at least on a regular basis, because you think about how deep our ocean may get in certain parts, and you know the currents are definitely going to change with um, uh, with, with depths, right? The different currents. If you think about all the currents that run across the ocean conveyor belt, and then the surface currents are going to be different from that. So yeah, so we use these devices to look at things like the salinity, um, salt in the water, dissolved oxygen, and that, and as well as just tracking the current. So we really don't know everything there is to know about our current. Scientists, physical, physical oceanographers are still learning a lot about it. For example, Mobile Bay. We really don't understand all of the current in our own bay. Nobody's really ever studied it for a long time scale to know. We have some short glances where scientists have looked at it and we know seasonal observations, but there isn't a large network of either permanent data buoys out there to collect all of the data or drifters that have been released to really track some of those surface currents. So uh, our physical, physical oceanographer got some funding through some of the oil spill money that went to the, the Gomery organization. He was in a consortium working on that. And so they wanted to know 
how it moves out of Mobile Bay and where might that oil go if it was trying to come in. So they released a bunch of drifters right here off the mouth of Mobile Bay um, looking at that. So it is something that we're getting more interested as there are issues like the oil spill and other things that we want to know about. I put up this one, talked about garbage patches. What I wanted you guys was to see was this large scale current. So we're looking at some small scale currents with the students. But the big oceanographers, right, they're studying some of the really large currents. And these are called gyres. Have you guys ever heard that term before? It's just talking about the circular motion that we get as we follow these currents. And most of them are um, wind-driven. Um, the Coriolis effect, some of those all play roles in them too. And what this poster focuses on then is how garbage accumulates in those. And that's when I talked about some of these rubber duckies. That's what they went through, right? They went through these gyres right off the coast here. You can see a little loop up this direction. And that's why they were washing up all around the world. They were getting caught in these different currents. And so they really want to study those. And I have this map, and I can pass this one around. If you think about all the different groups and organizations that have drifters around the world, I downloaded this yesterday from NOAA, which is our National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that does a lot with physical oceanography. But this is the status of the Global Drifter Array, and there are currently 1,361 known drifters in our ocean, and they're from countries all across the world, right? Most of the countries around the world, especially you know, first world countries, are really interested in studying these currents maybe local ones, but for different reasons. And so they have all of these drifters out. And a lot of these end up just getting left. Now, if they wash up, they'll have the information from that organization on them, and they can, hopefully someone will call and return it, but they don't expect to get all of them back. And if you, we can pass that around if you guys wanna just kinda glance, it's color-coded by country, but it really shows you the, the number of, of drifters and the interest we have. Okay, so let me tell you more about how we're gonna use these drifters with students. So Tina and I, which is the head of our department, we got a grant through GOMA, which is the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, and they focus a lot on marine debris. Um, I did, I think, a boardwalk talk last year talking about marine debris, but it has to do with these garbage patches, right? Trash that ends up out in the ocean. Where does it go and how can we introduce that to students, right, and make them more environmentally aware? Well, we thought that the environmental side might not be enough for every student. Not all of them are interested in environmental issues. So we wanted to tag technology onto it and get some of those um, engineering-minded students engaged in what's going on and show them that they can do um, things as well out in the oceans, but from a different point of view. So we connected that with drifters. And so we got a small grant to develop some curriculum for us to use in our classes, as well as to give to teachers across the state. We developed it for Alabama teachers, but it could be modified for other um, groups of teachers as well. We just focused on the Alabama watershed since that's what we have. Um, and teaching them about marine debris and how that can turn into a technology um, activity for their classes. So we introduced the marine debris topic to the students. We let them uh, maybe do a trash cleanup. We've developed a class with marine debris now that students can get involved and learn about microplastics and some of the other big focus areas on marine debris, some of those hot topics that are out there. But then we wanted them to learn to design a drifter. So I basically, all the information I just shared with you, we share with students with a fun PowerPoint with pictures and videos. There's some really cute videos on different drifters and drifter programs. Um, but we have students design mini drifters. Now these were actually done by some teachers at a workshop we did last week. We give them a hodgepodge of different materials, some that float, some that sink. We tell them the basic parts of a drifter, right? It's got to have a, a part at the surface for the sensor to go in. It has to have that body, that drogue part, um, and sometimes they make veins, sometimes they just use other materials, and then something to weigh it down, right? And we give them a bowl of water, and that's their mini ocean to test their drifter in. And so they design it. You can see the teachers definitely had fun with it and designed all variety of drifters from the different materials that they had that float or sink. Um, these are just a few of the fun ones that I thought were, were very different and interesting. Um, and then we took them to a large ocean. We had a large tub in the front of the classroom and we introduced wind, right? Because they don't want the wind to move their drifter. And so they get to test it out and then 
test and redesign and test. So it really brings in those engineering design concepts that they're going to get a different group of students involved and interested in. And then the last part, and it's what we're still working on, is then those classrooms would design their own full-scale drifter, right? This size full-scale drifter, not the type that they're really going to take out in the oceans, but one that they can use within the Alabama watershed, right? So they could hopefully find a local river or stream that's deep enough to hold a drifter about that size and take it out and release it using that spot tracker. They could watch it in real time and see where it's going. Now the students may not be able to retrieve it, so they might need the help of another group or organization or another teacher that could go and collect it either by kayak or by small boat, depending on where they are. But it lets them know how their trash, right, is moving into the watershed and how their local watershed or rivers and streams connect with some of the larger issues, right, that are out there. So there are some really cool um, programs that we introduce the students to. One's called Streamer. Um, and you can actually put in your location and it will trace your nearby watershed. You can trace it out to the Gulf of Mexico or you can trace it back to the source. So it's a really fun one out there by USGS that we let the students play with. And you can really just, you know, lose yourself in it. You guys have been a great audience. Oh, well, thank you.